Okay, that's great. Uh, let us start. So it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Granville that will talk about primes in short intervals, heuristics and calculations. Please, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Muito obrigado pelo convite. Obrigado. Okay, that's, that's the Portuguese for today from me. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about primes and short intervals and discuss some work I've been doing with Elisa Lumley, who's a postdoc here in Montreal, on uh, trying to make some guesses at, at the way things should be distributed and some calculations which um, sometimes back up our guesses, sometimes uh, don't make one entirely confident of our guesses. So this is really experimental math, but it's sort of in uh, the vein of probabilistic number theory. So um, we're going to be interested in the maximum and minimum number of primes in intervals of length y. So I'm going to think of them between little x and 2x. So capital M is the maximum. So we take every interval x to x plus y, look at the primes, count the number of primes in it, and maximize where the starting point is between little x and twice little x. And similarly, the minimum, though the main focus will be on the maximum, and there's a reason for that, which is that it's widely believed that the minimum is zero for y all the way up to log squared x. And um, as we'll discuss, we'll mostly be working with y less than log squared x. So um, the maximum is more relevant to the talk. So it's believed that if um, y, if the length of the interval y is bigger than log squared x by a little bit, then you're always going to get around y over log x primes in an interval of length y. Now, it's known that you get an asymptotic, you actually get between 1 minus epsilon 1 plus epsilon y over log x for 100% of intervals. But that's not all, of course, there are exceptions. 100% means as x goes to infinity, the density of intervals that have a property, the number of primes looks like y over log x tends to one. But there is an exceptional set. And Helmut Meyer in the 80s showed that the number of primes in interval of length y can be out by a constant factor um, occasionally. So that's why I'm using the less than less than symbol, which just means there exists a positive constant. So this is bigger than some little constant times y over log x and some big constant. Now, it's not proved, this could be wrong, but um, I think it's a pretty good chance it's true, as we'll talk about. So in fact, the maximum is what I'm interested in. And here we believe a maximum, well, it's certainly bigger than, so the average number of primes in interval of length y in that interval will be about y over log x. So the maximum is certainly going to be greater than y over log x. And the question is, can we give an upper bound for the maximum? And we believe that, yeah, it should be less than some constant times y over log x, maybe 1.1 or something like that. Anyway, so once y is bigger than log squared x, the maximum looks like y over log x. And what I want you to notice here about this maximum is that it's a function of, as a, so I'm gonna think of x is very large and fixed and y is slowly growing. So we have this function y over log x, which is linear in y, and it's got a slope log x. Now, what we believe is that we really get an asymptotic when y is bigger than an arbitrary power of log x. It really looks like y over log x. So what we really get is that we've got linear growth in this maximum, and the slope is 1 over log x. So let me go to the next page. OK. <laughs> I'll figure out what button to push to go next week. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we're going to look at y less than less than log squared x. As I said, we kind of know, we think what happens with y greater than log squared x. And it's going to turn out that there are four ranges to think about. First thing when y is really small, so essentially fixed plus a little bit of movement, like its size log x, up to about size log x. We're going to see one type of flavor of behavior for the maximum number of primes and intervals of length y. Then we're going to look at y between about log x and log x squared, but not quite constant times log x squared, up to a very small epsilon times log squared x. And I'll just say now that, that 
quantifying what that means when you're trying to do calculations is a problem. So in other words, if I want to do some computations to compare conjectures, what do I mean by little o in terms of, if I'm looking at say x is 10 to the 12, where does this range actually go up to? How do I interpret little o? It's not obvious what the right answer to that is. Then we've got the range where y is like a constant times log squared x, which has its own behavior. And then as I've just discussed with y bigger than log squared x significantly, we think that mxy is linear in y, essentially, and essentially that will have a slope of one over log x. Okay, so let me start with the lowest range. So here, we're looking at y smaller than log x. So what I'm going to do is look at the primes. Well, let me just start with y fixed, okay? And what, here's, here's what often happens in the smallest range of values for the variable is you work out what happens with fixed, and then you see if you can um, let y grow slowly and still make the same arguments work. So, you know, you've probably done this in your own work. You, you have something work for y fixed, and then probably with a little bit of play, it works for y growing very slowly. So we're looking at the integers between x and x plus y, I'm asking for a prime. So one way to think of them is you take the number x and you add an integer n between one and y and ask if that is prime. So I'm going to write this in this, this sort of uh, additive combinatorics notation, which is you add x to the set a. So the set a are these n values. And I'm going to ask whether, um, so the, these a values, the values in a are the integers n such that x plus n is prime. It's a subset of one through y. And once you go beyond y, once there's intervals beyond y, the set is admissible. Now I'll remind you, I didn't write it down, because I assume people in the seminar have met admissible before, but um, this means that there exists a congruence class modulo each prime, which does not contain an element of a. So again, for every prime p, there is some congruence class which has no elements of a. That's what makes a admissible. So the whole point of this is something like, um, if you take n and n plus one, you can't have infinitely many prime pairs n and n plus one because you, the zero and one occupy every congruence class mod two. Or if you do n, n plus two, n plus four, the zero, two, and four occupy every congruence class mod three. So we basically need to make sure there's a free residue class modulo every prime. So one thing that's clear is that this set A must be admissible when we're in the, in the region which we're talking about, because x is greater than y. And um, this, if we want to bound the number of, well, the number of primes in this interval, it's going to be the size of this set A. So, and we know the set's admissible, so the maximum number of primes is no more than the maximum size of an admissible set. So I've just described what admissible is. Um, and so removing one residue class from the integers between one and y, because we start with one and y, right? one to y, right? So we'll remove one residue class from one to y for every prime less than y. What's left is an admissible set. And you could, you could do that over all possibilities for residue classes for all of the primes less than y, figure out what the maximum is, and that would be your bound here. So um, let me try and phrase that. So let's put a little terminology in, which we're going to need to use. Firstly, P of Z is the product of all the primes up to Z. And S, N, Y, Z will be, you take all the integers between N and N plus Y, and you're asking for those that are co-prime to Z, okay? So let's think of, um, we've got these integers N plus a set of integers between one and Y. So if I write uh, this little n as n plus capital M, so these capital M's are between one and y in here, then I want the, the condition of being this set is that they're co-prime to um, the product of the primes up to z. So they're, co they're not divisible by any prime up to z. So um, P does not divide n plus m, capital N plus m, which means M is not congruent to minus capital N mod P, which means that M is not congruent to AP mod P. 
So, okay, this is totally trivial. If you've never seen it before, it may be a bit much. But all I'm basically saying is, is that if n plus m is not divisible by prime p, then m cannot be congruent to minus capital N log p. But the point is I've transformed the problem of some interval somewhere into just looking at the integers up to y. So what we find is that this maximum is going to be, ooh, um, this maximum. Yep. Num Hello, this is Bill Walsh with AARP. AARP what on earth is happening? Is that me or somebody else? Oh my. Does anybody know what just happened? I do not know what, what, what has happened because, okay, I think we, you can continue. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be me. Anyway, um, so um, we're looking at the maximum size of admissible set. Um, basically, it's looking at the integers um, between one and y, which aren't in some congruence class. That would be a missable set for each prime p less than or to z. And that's the size, as we've just seen by this simple transformation, of the maximum of sieving any interval of length y by the primes up to y. So this is a well-known sieve problem, a linear sieve problem. You're removing one congruence class per prime. And um, the best bound that's known is basically the length of the interval y, what, what you'd expect perhaps on an average interval is how many integers will be left when you sieve one congruence class with every prime less than y. You start with y integers, and then you remove one over p of those integers for every prime up to y. So you'd expect y times the product of one minus one over p, for p up to y are left. In other words, you'd expect e to the minus gamma y over log y. So the maximum might be a little bit bigger, and we do know, um, let's think, there's one interval we know which has significantly more than e to the minus gamma y over log y left. Let's look at the, the primes between y and 2y. So if you sieve the integers between y and 2y, either you've got a prime is left, or, well, nothing else, because everything else between y and 2y has a prime factor less than y. So how many primes are there between y and 2y? That would be about y over log y. So we know the maximum can be as big as y over log y, and yet sieve methods sadly only give us twice what the best example I know. Well, up to a little bit. So um, this also is kind of you know, said called the Brinton-Titchmarsh theorem, at least when we um, looked at it in a certain way. So this is the best unconditional bound twice y over log y. We actually believe that the correct bound is one times, and that something like the prime between y and uh, y and two y is more or less best possible up to the secondary term. So um, that would also say what's the most primes you could have in an interval of length y. So um, what we believe is it's essentially y over log y. But if this bound can't be improved. And you believe in the prime k-tuples conjecture, which says for any admissible set there is a prime k-tuples, then we'd actually have intervals of 2y over log y primes. So we really don't believe that this is best possible as found. We really believe it should be improvable to 1. But um, Selberg observed, essentially, and it's not, he didn't exactly write this in his paper, but he more or less observed that if you could improve 2 to 1, then there would be no Siegel zeros. So most of you know what those are. So you just think of them, if you don't know what they are, as if the generalized Riemann hypothesis was false, then the most frustrating thing that definitely shouldn't be true, but you can't disprove, is that there are zeros very, very close to one on the real axis. And those are called Siegel zeros. And Siegel um, tried to understand those, so that's, uh, and tried to prove it didn't exist. Gave a lot of nice results about it, so in his honor, somewhat ironically, they're called Siegel zeros. Um, Sarnak objects to that. He says it's not really fair given Siegel devoted so much time to try and prove they don't exist, but I like Siegel zeros. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that's what should be, and this is the talk about what we believe, not what we know. Okay, 
So what we're guessing then is that the maximum number of primes in a short interval, I've used notation, I'm sorry that I forgot to change. The maximum nine prime, number of primes in a short interval of length y between x and 2x is the maximal size of an admissible set. That's what I mean by s of y. And we just said we think that should be about y over log y. So I actually believe, and so I'm going to talk about the heuristic quite a bit later, but we actually believe an equal sign here, for, well, for y fixed, certainly, but actually even for y up to about log x, the, the most primes you should get an interval of length y around x is the maximal size of an admissible set of length y. Let me show you the data. So this is the whole point, really, is we're making conjectures and then comparing to data. So it's a little tricky to see. So in all the data, I'm going to show you four graphs. And that's where I take x as 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12. So what we want to do is look at the data at each of those values of x and see if, if we can spot patterns, if, if as the power of 10 grows where we're looking. Now, you might say, why didn't we go to 10 to the 18, but to, which is roughly where people can compute up to. But we're asking for a lot of data points. So to get a lot of data points, we maybe could push this to 10 to the 13 at, an, at a real stretch, 10 to the 14 of a lot of work. But the goal here really was to get a feeling for what the data tells us rather than get the maximum amount of data. Um, OK, so what is it we're trying to test here? We're trying to test whether the most primes and intervals length y at around x is about y over log y, or is about the size of the maximal admissible set. So we've drawn this a slightly strange way. For each integer y, um, actually for each even integer y, because obviously um, you know, every other integer is, is even, so you're not going to get a prime there. Um, so for each even integer y, what we've looked at is we've put in blue the um, maximal number of primes. And this, in this graph, the maximum number of primes you can get between in an interval of length, well, here, for instance, 32, which is 32, this one. 32. So the maximum number of primes in an interval of length 32, where the interval is between 10 to the 9 and 2 times 10 to the 9. And that is the um, blue or purple dot. The square box is the maximal size of an admissible set. So we can see here that this conjecture that these are equal seems to be correct for, for instance, that x is 10 to the 9 all the way up to uh, 32. And here, like, likewise, and up at 10 to the 12, that gets, seems to be correct all the way up to about 48. So what, what is this dotted line here? Well, I said this should be true up to y about log x, and we drew a dotted line at log x. So up to log x, it seems like the maximum number of primes in the interval is really is the size of a maximum admissible set. In fact, it looks like you actually go a little bit beyond. You go to about one and a half, maybe. And then it starts to get a little bit less. The maximum number of primes is a little bit less than the size of a maximum admissible set. But that's fine. Our, our conjecture was go to, up to about log x, and that looks fine. But it appears maybe the phenomena even holds with something to spare. OK, so this is really good data. This is. OK, if you, if, you, if you want really, really excellent data, that's it. The rest of the data is, no, is not as good as this. Is. So um, let me talk about this conjecture. So we've said that we believe that the maximal size of an admissible set tells us the maximum number of primes into the length y for y up to about log x. And we know that up to a factor of two, this is y over log y, right? We know there are, there are multiple sets of size y over log y. We know they're bounded by two y over log y. And for y about log x, this looks like y over log log x. Whereas the maximum for y bigger than log squared x looks like y over log x. So these are both linear in y, but they're different slopes. So something very weird happens. Once y gets beyond log squared x, it kind of gets set in its way. And that maximum looks like a line, more or less. And it's got a slope 1 over log x. 
But for smaller y, it's more, it's like a line, but with a very, very different slope, a much bigger slope. So let's just have a look at how things grow. When y goes from one to log x, well, you start with basically one prime or no primes, and you get up to about log x over log log x. So the growth between, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let y go through multiplicative intervals of length log x. So as you go from one to log x, the maximum number of primes into length y grows by a factor that looks like log x over log log x. And from here, what we've got is, as we go from say log x squared to log x cubed, the, the, the number of primes in, in, in an interval of length y grows by a factor of about log x. So the behavior between one and log x and the behavior as you go from log squared x to log cubed x is about the same, much for a small factor. But here's where it's really weird. This is so weird. Um, I should have a pen, shouldn't I? That'd be fine. Um, you can let me. Ah, let's see. Oh, here's a little drawing thing. Like that. Okay, so yeah, so with a bit of luck, this will work. So what we have around here, well, not a very good piece of drawing, but, but what we had from one to log X is that this maximum grew like log X with a small factor. Beyond this interval, it grows like log X, but in here, it grows incredibly slowly, the maximum, like log log X, it just slows down. So that's, really, that's something that really needs to be understood. So what we're seeing, oh, now I've got to stop that somehow. Okay. Yes, okay, good. Oh, I can't get rid of those now. Ah, I shouldn't have done something I don't know how to do. Okay, hopefully that's good. So what, what we see is that there's a very different change in mxy when we go from log x to log x squared. We feel we understand up to log x. That's where the maximum looks like maximum miscible set. Here, it's sort of old, old uh, stuff that's well known. It looks like about log x. But in here, things are different. OK, so let me tell you our conjecture for what happens is y goes from log x to log squared x. And this is really, really weird. So basically, y is growing as a power of log x from 1 to 2. And this is our conjecture, <clears throat> that all that changes between 1 and 2, but notice that's a less than sign, is the constant. So 1 over 2 minus a is like a function of log y. So whereas the other growth look like linear in y. This somehow looks like a function of log y, the growth here. It's very strange. So it's just a different constant times log x of log log x. As you grow the length of the interval between log x, log x of 2 minus epsilon, you don't get many more primes. It's a very strange thing. And then, well, you've got to be a bit more precise about what happens at the top end. So this is really the first order of the formula we have. If you substitute in log x to the a for y here, you'll get this formula. And there's a little, as I said, for data, you've got this problem of how do you interpret the low when you're trying to look at data. So I'm just going to pick a, that, a small constant times log squared x for the data, bearing in mind our log x's aren't very large. OK, so on to the next slide. So here's what happens with our conjecture. So our conjecture says for y between log x and little over log squared x, that mxy should look like this thing. And um, well, here's the data. So um, yeah, so the purple is the actual data points. Well, as you saw in the previous graph, the maximum may stay the same for a few consecutive values and then jump up. So the purple graph, the purple dots give you the maximum. And um, the green line gives you our prediction LXY. And in this graph, we're taking um, the values between a half log X and a half log X squared. That's basically 
well, I'm taking a little o, the half. What you can see is that um, there seems to be a crossing point here where these meet, and that's actually amazingly close to log x. Again, the dotted lines at log. Log 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12. And there seems to be a second meeting point up here of the data in our, our uh, prediction. It's not bad. I mean, we've drawn the graph in as honest a way as possible. I could have drawn it a little more dishonestly, like m divided by l. And you would have looked at this and thought, oh, those are pretty, pretty similar. But if you draw it like this, I mean, I think the right interpretation is that the first order term is probably correct for L, but there's something in the middle that makes the data concave down and makes our prediction concave up. And that's something that needs to be understood. We had a go. We found the second term using the, the uh, heuristic we've been using, but it didn't do much for the graph. So this is a little bit mysterious, but I still think it's a good approximation. This is the weirdest thing we've got, is that um, yeah, the number of primes in these intervals grow so slowly. OK, so now let's look to y is a constant times log squared x. So looking at t log squared x, we're going to have to solve some sort of implicit equation to get our constant. And it's a bit complicated, isn't it? We're going to have to explain a few things. So firstly, for a given value of t, we're going to solve this equation, which if t is greater than zero, only has one solution bigger than t. Now, for those of you who know some probability theory, this is some sort of entropy type equation. It looks, if you, if you know this stuff, it looks like the logarithm of um, binomial probabilities. Um, and yeah, that's where it comes from. Actually. So um, with the model we're going to use, we actually take this function, and if we're at t log squared x, we're looking at intervals of length t log squared x, well, you'd expect roughly t log x to be the number of primes in such an interval. And what we predict is the maximum is this function times um, log x. This function looks like t as t goes to infinity, but when t is small, it's a bit different. And um, the... Um, constant c plus i'll explain a little bit about later it comes from the small sieve we don't know enough about the small sieve to say what the constant is it's just defined in terms of something in the small sieve but we do have a bound, lower bound on it which is 1.015 some people conjecture it is 1.015 i tend not to be one i mean if your only basis for conjecturing is i don't know anything else that's not a good basis i know some people have conjectured it um, about certain sieve constants but i from all I can see, they've done it on the basis that they don't know anything else. Not a good reason to think that. Anyway, so let's have a look at the data with, with this prediction. So I'm looking at graphs of size, sorry, t log squared x. And I'm comparing it to my prediction for, or our prediction for Lissa, um, of how many primes there are in such an interval. And what you can see is, well, here's the data points. And um, so this is on a, so the reason this looks roughly linear is this is on a logarithmic scale. Okay, so this axis is, looks like t times log squared. Okay, and then here is the prediction. And what you can see in each graph is, firstly, the data looks not entirely dissimilar, the black fuzzy caterpillar thing. And our pinkish uh, prediction is way over the top. It's the right shape but it's way over the top. So, um, yeah, so if you look at the data, it's about 20 to 25% out. So here's the problem. I could just say, ah, it's some function like that and make the purple, the pink line run right along the data. But we have an honest heuristic basis for our conjectures. So what I prefer to believe is that we're right and the data is wrong, or at least, You've got to get to x big enough for our conjectures to look correct. But I can argue against that too later on, if I have time. So, so far, we've only looked at the maximum number of primes in the short interval. And the reason we've only looked at maximum is because for y less than log squared x, we expect there are intervals with no primes. But now we get to a bigger than some constant times log squared x. We expect that every interval has primes. And so, 
um, it's worthwhile looking at the minima. And we can play the same game. Now, um, this argument only really works for t greater than 1, so y bigger than log squared x. Because in that case, there's a second solution to the same uh, entropy type equation. And it's a solution. Remember that u plus was bigger than t, with i bigger than the average. u minus is actually between 0 and t. So there's a second solution. You can prove these are the only two positive real solutions. And our prediction is very similar. With the maximum, we had u plus c plus t. Again, c comes from the small set, the c minus. This time, it's um, e to the gamma over 2 is the best bound we know on um, c minus, the best upper bound, which is about 0.89. And um, well, some of you who know the sieve will even know where that comes from. It's not an uncommon constant. Um, there is, again, the conjecture of these two are equal, but I'm not convinced by that. I, I'll, at the end of the talk, I'll talk about something I did with Siegel zeros uh, in the last few weeks. And Kevin Ford, almost the moment he saw it, said, but uh, you know, this would mean that C minus here is zero. So, which has a very interesting consequence that I'll discuss later. So, well, Kevin said something that's essentially equivalent to that. It's, let's put it that way. I don't want him to say, I'm, he didn't say that. Um, okay, so yeah, next. Let's have a look at the prediction versus the data. So again, the um, prediction is in the blue. So the data is in the blue. And again, you see it go and takes a while maybe before it jumps up. And the um, prediction is in the uh, orangey red. So again, the data looks like it's following some curve that's pretty similar as you go through 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12. And our uh, prediction is way out. It's way below a lot of the time. So one interesting thing is just to look at where this uh, comes up, the data. So we've drawn this line rather peculiarly, but this is just an observation from data at about 3 quarters log squared x. So at 10 to the 8, the first non-zero value is a little bit below 3 quarters log squared. Getting closer to 3 quarters log squared, basically is 3 quarters log squared, gets past 3 quarters log squared. So it's growing very, very slowly. Maybe it grows like I think it does, which is it should only take off over here. So Maybe at 10 to the 100, we'll see that the minimum number of primes in the interval um, you know, starts, we start getting non zero once we get up to um, the prediction. OK, so this, this minimum is very much tied into the largest gap between consecutive primes. So let's just look at that very specifically. So this. Um, discussion implies that the maximum gap between primes between x and 2x should be about this constant inverted um, times log squared, which is 2e to the minus gamma, which is this. Um, and again, so actually, I, I first conjectured this about 25 years ago, and I had this greater than or equal to because that's kind of what comes out of the heuristic model. Um, I had this strange thing that on Wikipedia they decided they discuss it and they put this was that my conjecture was equal and I really didn't care about Wikipedia but at some point I saw a paper that quoted my conjecture from Wikipedia the conjecture I hadn't made in fact I'd gone at great pains to not make and put an inequality um, so I didn't really know what to do since I didn't want to work out how to change things on Wikipedia um, so I, I found some people who were changing things on Wikipedia and, and asked them some little group and then they said, well, can you prove your Andrew Granville? It's like, it's too painful. Anyway, so I think now it is changed to greater than. I think th thanks to a recent paper from part of Banks, Ford, and Tower who discuss um, a diff slightly different model and get roughly the same sorts of uh, remarks. So um, the maximum gap between consecutive primes around x should be about 2e to the minus gamma log squared x. It could be this is equal if, if nothing if we really have the best sieve, but I doubt it. Um, Kramer, the original conjecture was log squared x here. Yeah? Um, and I'll explain what he kind of did wrong. I mean, it's not the question he did something wrong. We still don't really know what the right conjecture is, of course. Anyway, let's have a look at the record breaking gaps. Um, so the columns are the prime, 
the distance from next prime, and then the record-breaking distance over log squared. And the important thing is that the biggest that's ever been found by humanity of difference in consecutive primes is 0.92 times log squared. We haven't even got to Kramer's one times log squared, never mind my 1.12. So the data doesn't bear out anything that's conjecture. And this goes considerably beyond where my computations of a list have gone. So I'm just going to graph this to give you some idea. And, and it's a, the graph's got more on it than I've said so far. So the spots here are essentially the record breakers. Okay sort of record breakers and intervals. And the two nicely drawn lines, here is Cramier's conjecture of log squared x being the maximum gap. Here's the conjecture I made 25 years ago of about 1.1 times log squared x. And here's all the data. And it certainly looks like it's on a different line. Now, you could, again, you could say maybe it's three quarters log squared x like that thing. And you probably get a pretty good match. But there are various reasons for thinking we're really missing secondary terms. And the secondary terms might well be a log x times a log log x and a log x. So what I thought might be fun was to just see if we could take log squared x plus a times log x log x plus b times log x and do some curve fitting. And similarly, with the constant 2e to the minus gamma, and here's our two curve fits. Look at that. They're amazing. They're right. Now, firstly, who would have thought if you have Completely different coefficients at the start, but these two would be so close together. I mean, it's just, I mean, I know nothing about data, what it boils down to. Anyway, so we did this, this calculation, did the best fit thing, and uh, they both look like great fits. So somehow we've got to come up justifying, you've got to subtract, I mean, from my model anyway, five log x, log squared, log log x, and add back in six log x. There actually is a beautiful idea of Cadwell a different heuristic that, that knocks out a log x, log log x. But I really can't see how to adapt it, nor how to get a five. Anyway, that's beside the point. Just to say, again, these conjectures are way out. And yeah, we can come up with a conjecture that's very close to the data, but I'm not sure how meaningful that is. OK, so here's everything on the same graph. Here's the minimum. Here's the average. Here's the maximum. And here's these rotten predictions. And you can see, well, OK, here's the good part, right? The minimum is nearer the prediction than it is to the average. And the maximum is nearer the prediction than it is to the average. But they ain't near. So um, there's more to be understood, that's for sure. So these graphs go between a third log squared x and two log squared x, which is kind of the, the key range, I guess, for this. OK, since that, that stunk, um, I thought it might be interesting to just look at this growth thing. So um, how does um, this grow? Well, what we said was when y is less than log x and y is bigger than log squared x, it kind of grows linearly. And that essentially means this ratio is going to be 2. And when we're in this intermediate range between log x and log squared x, this ratio should be more like 1. Remember, we just had log x over log log x times a constant. So what we're going to be interested in here is um, how the data for these, how the maximum grows compared to the predictions given by these complicated functions. So here we are. So you can see the data, I mean, they, this data, it, it doesn't look dissimilar from graph to graph. And our prediction, well, it, 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 you know, because we're in a certain range, it's not quite as low as 1. It doesn't get as high as 2. It's from 1.3 to about 1.6 in this range. But um, I guess I, I would argue this curve, especially down here, this looks like it's fitting this curve. It's just a little bit above it. Yeah, do you believe me? I don't know. So maybe this is pretty good. Again, it's the x is small. Who knows what that means? OK, so let me tell you a little bit about how we do this kind of thing. So Gauss, when he was uh, 14 or 15 years old, looking at the table of primes up to 3 million, observed for himself that the density of primes near 2x is about 1 over log x. And this, of course, leads to the prediction for the prime number theorem of Lie of x. In 1936, Harold Cramier, um, who because became very famous, of course, as a great statistician, but his PhD was 
in analytic number theory and partly applying statistical ideas to analytic number theory, um, he uh, said, well, why don't we just look at independent random variables for n greater than or equal to three with the property that it's one if with probability one over log and zero if one minus one over log. So you look at this sequence of random variables. Well, you can think of the primes as being a series of zeros and ones. So there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The ones all correspond to primes. And Cramier kind of made this hypothesis that if you've got some, some property that's true inside this probability space of probability one, then it's probably true about the primes, or at least the odd primes. So for us, we're looking at, at uh, numbers between x and 2x, and then that simplifies things because these log n are just log x essentially. So we'll just think of them as fixed. It's really not going to change anything. And so we can just think of these probabilities as being probability one is one over L, where L is low over log x. Um, zero is one minus one over L. They're independent identity distributed random variables. And we know what to do. It's called a binomial distribution. So we can sum these guys up. And what's the probability of the interval of length y has k primes, or the, num the, sum the number of xn's, number of n's in that interval will have xn equals 1, is uh, this probability, right? Just the regular binomial probability. How many intervals do we have between x and 2x? It's a little bit careful. If, you've got to be a little bit careful for independence, because if two over intervals overlap, they're not independent. Because here we're, we, we would like to work as probability where we think of these as all independent. So we could just split it up into intervals of length from x to x plus y, x plus y to x plus 2y, et cetera. So that would give us x over y intervals. And with y so small, x over y and x aren't that different, conflictively. So anyway, so for y small, less than log x over log log x, what I want to do is look at the probability that this sum is equal to y. And just plugging in, I get 1 over l to the y. And I chose y, so this is bigger than 1 over root x, essentially. And so actually, you know, Borel can tell you and all this kind of thing. You can actually prove that with probability 1, the sum of random variables, the primary random variables, the interval length y, will actually equal y. In other words, Cramer's hypothesis says that there are intervals that are this large that contain exactly this many primes. OK, we know that's nonsense, right? Um, Ooh, I thought I'd put something that said it, but um, why do we know that's nonsense? Well, an interval length y, you're going to start dividing out by twos and threes, and, and the miss size that we said, the, the most primes you can have is the maximal size of an admissible set, which isn't y, it's more like y over log y. So this is horribly wrong, Kramer's model. Now, I'm giving a different reason, why, a slightly different reason why Kramer's model is wrong. Um, usually people just say, well, look at the nn plus one prediction. His, he would argue this, Kramer would argue as x over log squared x primes. Current pairs, um, n n plus 1, and we know there, there aren't so many. So, um, yeah, but these are fundamentally the same idea. The problem with Kramer's heuristic is he's not dealing with small primes. Um, so there's a very obvious thing to do, which is take small primes into account. So to modify Kramer's heuristic, we're going to look at the integers between x and 2x, and we're immediately going to throw away anything that has a small prime factor. And I'm going to introduce a new variable here where small prime factor means less than z, less than or equal to z. Now, I need to adjust my probability because when I've thrown away integers which have a small prime factor, the remaining integers is significantly fewer of them. And so um, what's the probability that one of these integers is prime, the ones that have no prime factor less than z? Well, it's going to be log x times an adjustment factor for all the things we threw away. And it shouldn't surprise you that it's VP over here. So this should be a better model. That's, that's the idea. So we pre save by the primes less than or equal to y. Oh, I didn't finish that sentence. Xn is 0 if it has a prime factor less than or equal to z, in other words. And so now instead of working with all the integers in x to x plus y, we work instead with just those integers that have no small prime factor. Um, this, uh, sorry, the sieve, I meant the size of the set. You can see where I was rushing. Um, so this set is, we just introduced, we introduced this before, right? The integers in x to x plus y, which have no prime factor less than x to z, is S capital X, Y, Z. 
And let me suppose that the size of it is n, um, which is going to be less than y once we sit those things out. Now our model says, OK, now we have n random variables. We haven't got this nonsense with the small primes. So maybe this should tell you the probability that you get k primes in interval length y. And all we've already done here is change the n to a y, and the l has a different y. OK, so um, if we were to take z equals y and sieve out with all the primes less than to y, then we know that n would be the size of the maximal, um, would have to be less than or equal to the size of the maximal admissible set. And this would fit in very well with what we were saying earlier. So the idea is to predict the distribution of primes using such a model. And let me just talk a little bit about why I pick z and y to be different. So one of the things we have to understand is this number n. How many integers are there? The interval length y with x, the interval between x and 2x, which have no small prime factor. So we need to understand how this varies as capital X varies between little x and 2x. And obviously, it would be desirable to sieve all the way up to the length of the interval. But here's the problem. If you look at this, and you look at the GCD of a number of P of Z, well, that GCD only depends on N mod P of Z. So certainly, this total quantity depends only on capital X mod P of Z. And so we can work with this quite easily if X is bigger than P of Z. Otherwise, we've got another big problem, which is sieving, getting the exact upper and lower bounds for sieving intervals with primes going beyond that. So um, yeah, so this kind of restricts z to be no bigger than log x. But if we want to take, well, this, this whole talk really is about log x to a power between 1 and 2. So we want to take y to be slightly bigger than log x. So we can't take z equals y and make this model um, work to our, in our favor. So we kind of got one of these balancing acts, which is irritating, but what can you do? So here's what we're going to do. We'll take z to be epsilon log x. That'll make life easy because um, for each n, it's a value of s, x, y, z. And how many x are there in a congruence class mod p, z? Well, it's going to be little x over p, z. And if p, z is small, then x over p, z is like between x and x to the 1 minus epsilon. So it's not going to be, so we can think of it essentially as x. So we're going to look for each n, which is a value, at the number of x. We know that that's about x to the 1 minus epsilon value for capital X. And then we can run the model for each n in this range. And that gives us our predictions. OK, so um, let me finish off with a few words about Civ methods. Um, so part of this investigation was to try and understand these sieving questions and to understand the range of n, because that's very important to what we're doing. And I wanted to take y bigger than z. And so you know, the way you sieve an interval is to use a sieve method. So let me just remind you very quickly on sieve methods. So let a be a set of integers you want to sieve, and it will have size length size y. It'll be y integers in the set. In our case, we're looking at the integers in an interval from x to x plus y. The Typical sieve problem just says the number divisible by d looks like a multiplicative function, oh, sorry, that should be times y, multiplicative function times the number of elements in the set a plus an error term. And this should be a multiplicative function. In our case, it's going to be always 1, right, the g of d. The number of inches in interval divided by d is like length of the interval divided by d. And we're going to consider the sieve case where g is about 1 on average. So that's what's known as sifting dimension 1 or kappa equals 1. And then these error terms should be small on average as part of a usual sieve hypothesis, which means basically less than or equal to one. The goal of sieve theory is to bound the number of integers in our set A, which have no prime factor less than or equal to Z. So you can, this is purposely set up by, by Selberg and others to be general. So you not only include sieving intervals, but you can sieve, for instance, the product n, n plus two, where, so you're searching, say, for twin prime. And you can sieve many, many things. So what do we expect this to be? We expect it to be the length of the interval y times the product of 1 minus, well, the amount you remove for each prime, in our case, 1 minus 1 over p, more generally gp over p. So there's a very great theorem by Euclid and Richard from 1965 that says that in the general sieve problem, as I've just described it, you can get upper and lower bounds. And these are that if 
y, which is the number of integers in your set, is z to the u, where z is the size of the prime factors, then the amount you sieve by is here's what you expect times some um, times some uh, uh, functions, which depend only on this u, the upper and lower bounds. And these functions, well, I'm not going to say what they are, but they're basically in terms of bush stabs function and, and the dickman de Bruyne function, which I, you know what they are, you don't. The, all I'll say is they, they both can be defined in terms of everything here, and this line can be defined in terms of integral delay equations. Now, the, soon after their theorem, uh, Selberg and Ivaniets um, independently observed that this is a best possible result, that if you take the set A, which is, what is the set? Let me take the A plus, that's where lambda m, which is Louisville's function, is minus one. So that's the integers that have an odd number of prime factors counting multiplicity. And what they said was that if you take the integers that have an odd number of prime factors counting multiplicity, you'll actually hit this bound uniformly. And if you take the integers with an even number of prime factors, you'll hit this bound uniformly. So this is best possible. So um, that's all well and good, but that's, this is not an interval, right? So personally, I'm much more interested, at least for this project, in sieving intervals in some weird old set about odd and even number of prime factors. So the question is, can we do better when we're just sieving an interval? Instead of sieving an arbitrary set A, just x to x plus y. Now, here's the sad result that I proved, is that if you assume there are infinitely many of these annoying Siegel zeros, then there, there are infinitely many intervals which attain the lower and upper bound. So we want to better understand sieving constants for what we're doing. And sadly, what we've managed to prove is that um, you can't improve them unless you prove there are no Siegel zeros. And so that ain't gonna happen with these. Okay, just very, very finally, I just want to say a few words about the y equals y less than log x uh, heuristic. So the famous hardly little word conjecture says that if I want, um, if I want to count the number of prime integers between x and x plus 2x, where n plus a is prime for each a in a set, then it looks like this famous product times x of log x to k, where these omegas count the number of arithmetic progressions, which do not contain an aj. Sorry, which do contain an AJ. Um, and here we're going to take an admissible set of size K, which is like Y of log Y or two lie of log Y, left a little bit vague at the alpha, and of length Y. So what I want to do is compute this product. Given the time, I won't go into details, but um, you can separate it up into the primes greater than Y, not much contribution. The primes um, between Y and K, not much contribution, equal little OK. The main contributions from the primes less than k, and that we can't get hold of very well because wp could be anywhere from 1 to p minus 1. This product's only, what we can say is it's between 1 and e to the minus k. Therefore, what we can say about the whole Euler product is it looks like this. So notice here I didn't include the 1 minus 1 over p to the minus k. So this is the product that appears in Littlewood's conjecture. Let me go to the next slide. So what we've said is you take the product that appears in the hardy little conjecture, you apply some fairly simple analytic number theory, and this thing looks like log k to the k, well, times a constant. So what we're interested in, well, what's the conjecture more or less? It says that it should be asymptotically this or bigger than this plus, say, square root of x. <clears throat> plus or minus, we believe everything in prime number theory is plus or minus square root of x. So the question is, um, when does this thing get bigger than one? And when does it get bigger than square root x? So I'm just going to plug in a value of x into my formula here. And what happens when I put in x is k to the ck? Then the denominator, I get ck log k. That can, the log k's cancel, and I get something like this with some constant. And it's a bit easier, the bigger one there to worry about. And Okay, well, when I compare it to this, then I get that this expression is bigger than x to the 1 minus 1 over c. Aha, that's pretty good. So if I just want to prove this is greater than 1, then I can take c about 1. And if I want to prove it's bigger than x to the half, I can take c about 2. So we can reformulate this a bit and just say, well, if I take the product of these a's, then this argument suggests we get primes so when x is bigger than q to the 1 plus epsilon, and uh, 
probably you get the good asymptotic formula of x bigger than q to the two plus epsilon. So um, yeah, so this is how we justify the, um, the original conjecture, not just by the Kramer type thing, but we can also just look at Harding little with Frank A. Tuple's conjecture and come up with a similar thing for that. So this conjecture is great because there's two justifications and the data looks great. Okay, that's it. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. So, guys, uh, if you have a question, this is time to. We have time to question. Well, I have something. It's more of a remark than a question. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, computations aren't going to capture extremely rare events, and I think that. Uh, helps to explain a lot of why the data doesn't match up very well with the conjectures uh, in, you know, even up to 10 to the 12th. Maybe, but I mean, you know, we, we tried to set up the heuristic to exactly look at it between X and 2X. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I mean, it's hard to give an answer to that or because, you know, obviously or, there's or, or like not this, what we conjecture. <laughs> That there could be, you know, at, at 10 to the 12th, there's some significant secondary and tertiary terms that <laughs> are yeah. just, they're, they're there. We don't know exactly what they are. So, so let me tell you, I did, I, I had this discussion at the end of your talk the last week. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gave a very nice talk from the number theory web. Um, and funny enough, James said I was wrong, but he, he was wrong as that happened. I was so, I'm so scared of Maynard, I didn't dare say, no James. But anyway, check this. So let me, let me repeat my remark. Um, so if you look, so here we're looking at the extreme values of number of primes and intervals. And instead you can look at the distribution and what um, the distribution should be ruled by a binomial distribution, as I've been saying. And when you look near to the center of binomial distribution, that looks like a normal distribution. And you can work out from our binomial model what the parameters of a normal distribution are, and there's a mean value and there's a variance. And um, for why, so here's the important part where James and I disagree, for why bigger than log x, that, that small. Um, Montgomery and Sandaraj and showed that the variance is wrong that comes out of the binomial distribution. But in fact, there's a second order term. And when you look at the data, it's a perfect match. I mean, <clears throat> you do, if you, if we have it, but I didn't get it up on the slide today. But if you look at the normal distribution from the prediction from binomial distribution, it looks to the, the actual data looks thinner than it should be. But if you um, take the Montgomery sound um, secondary term, then you get an almost perfect match. So what we know is that things go wrong even at the center of a distribution. So the, the question is, how can we then understand what happens at the tail, given that even this, this model even incorrectly predicts the variance. Anyway, so it's a mystery. I guess my, my only guess is that maybe one should play, with, I mean, you know, there's this problem of trying to use some number theory to think things through. But one, one idea would be to say, okay, let's not think of these binomial distributions as independent random variables. Let's suppose they have some sort of covariance going on. And I guess, you know, as number theorists, you might predict there's nothing to do with all the prime factors, but let me not worry about that. I'm just wondering, is there a model where you could come up with some sort of covariant, nice, simple covariance structure and get what Montgomery and Sound predicted? And maybe from that, one could predict the tail data. So I'm hoping to look at that, but if everybody, anybody else, anybody has any ideas, I'd love to discuss it. Okay, more questions? Uh, so I have a question or a comment, which is just a sort of follow up of, of what you were saying. So mm -hmm. did you use your model to predict anything that was in the tails of a distribution, but not quite so far in the tails as just the largest value? 
<laughs> yeah, that's probably would have been wise, wouldn't it? Well, no, we 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 did do some bar, bar charts um, for uh, certain things. Um, so I guess formally the answer is yes, but um, you know the range is pretty small. So we're looking at I think at ten to the eight or ten to the nine and computing everything, um, and um, what we had a range like 76 to 84 as the number of possible primes for the particular question we were looking at. So it's a little bit hard to distinguish what's the tail and what isn't. So does your model predict things that up to a point fit the data well, or does nothing in the model fit the data at the <laughs> scales of X that you're seeing? Thanks, thanks for putting it that way, Adam. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it depends on the question, right? So the, the question's smaller than log x, looks pretty good. Um, the, the problem with this, I mean, certainly this variance is very striking that, that we definitely, the binomial distribution doesn't give a right variance, but we knew that, but even the data knows that. Um, the, the big problem of trying to interpret the data is what does little o mean? What does something going to, you know, we, we do these calculations, um, well, we have to get rid of certain terms, otherwise you have such a messy thing sitting in front of you that it's hard to play with. Um, yeah, so, so I, I can't really answer that question. I can present the data so it looks like a fantastic fit. And I can present the data so you're like, I don't believe a word of what you're saying. Um, anyway, so I think it's somewhere in between really. But okay, it's an so interesting point, near the tail, what happens. So, so I guess one particular thing I could suggest, which is kind of motivated by some of what people have done for extreme values of zeta, is that, um, so we have these predictions for the largest value that the zeta function should take between capital T and twice capital T, for example, mm -hmm. as you know. And that's kind of very similar to finding the, the largest number of primes in interval event y between x and 2x. You just have one data point, which is the most extreme thing. Right. And it might or might not fit with the, the data you get very well. Um, so instead of doing that, what people are doing nowadays is you choose a, a random interval uh, of a certain length. And if you do that, instead of having to check all the way between t and 2t to find something, you have a, a lot of data that comes from this interval instead of just this one very extreme data point. So I guess a version of that for you would be choose a random interval of length, let's say x to the one half, between x and 2x, and then look for the largest number of primes in interval of length y on that sub-interval of length x to the one half. And then you get lots of data points because you have lots of random intervals of length x to the one half. And for each of them, you get a, a largest value in that sub-interval and you see how that fits with your prediction. Yeah, that's very nice, actually. That really yeah. is nice. That would yeah, be something you could try to do. Well, it would certainly give us a much better idea of, of how to, to work with this, uh, wrong variants because right now I have no idea um, really but this yeah this is a much this is a really nice idea thank you yeah it makes a lot of sense okay you have a lot of calculations to do I guess the other thing is about taking shorter intervals even though you take a lot of them is you can actually go quite a bit further larger in the size of x yeah, that's certainly what happens in the zeta function case, and I would assume here as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, there's a level at which I've been searching for the right statistics to compute, um, you know, especially given the, the parts of the calculations that didn't fit very well. And, you know, you, it's, it's this difficulty that you just have a tendency to think, well, it's a law of small numbers. I know my asymptotics are good. So uh, yeah, it's good to have something very testable like that. Any more questions or projects? We have time, guys. We have time yet. If anybody's interested in partaking in, especially the calculation side, um, you know, we'd be interested to hear from them. You know, it's, there's a lot of stuff. To, I should say that, that we, 
much of this theory um, can be translated to the arithmetic progression setting. So you just look, say, at uh, all the, arith all the, the uh, residue classes mod a million and ask um, how big is the smallest prime? Something like that. Or how many primes are there in, in the interval, you know, up to uh, log squared a million? Residue classes. So there's, there's the, the whole, the whole, it's very easy to translate to it. It also might be fun to try it on other polynomials. Linear. Is there any reason not to? It's probably best to test the bits that work well first. Anyway, so it's too large a project for just Silas and I. So if other people are interested, you're welcome to join. Okay, guys, more questions or comments? Oh, if not, Andrew, uh, thank you very much again for your nice talk. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Well, that was my first talk in Brazil. In Oh, but not, uh, no, not <laughs> <laughs> We have to fix this <laughs> as soon as possible. I know, well, you know, my PhD advisor now is living permanently in Brazil, Ribbon so, One. <laughs> he's in Rio. Um, oh. His wife isn't well, so he can't move. So, uh, sort of extra temptation. He's trying to persuade me to come well, before the crisis. <laughs> But when I was a master's student in IMPA, he was giving these very informal lectures that he called coffee and numbers. Coffee number with with the you just, you just uh, gather like five or six students and talk about number theory. It was my first contact with number theory because it was basically inexistent in Brazil. Yeah, there wasn't much back then. <laughs> No, for me, for me, I went from, I was an undergraduate and did one graduate year at Cambridge, and uh, this is 35 years ago, so the professors there were very formal, really. Um, and then uh, I actually read this book by Ribbonboim about Thomas last year, and ended up doing my PhD with him, and uh, it was such a delight working with somebody who really was nothing like the Cambridge professors. <laughs> a very positive attitude to life, and more to life than just the math. <coughs> Good education work with Paolo. But, so you met him in Cambridge? Or, or in... No, 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 no. I just read this book. He wrote this book. Ah, okay. This is before Andrew Wiles had proved his great theorem. There's a book called 13 Lectures on Fermat's Last Theorem that in a very nice way described the state of the art up to then. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I... I Actually, I talked to Brian Birch at Oxford about being his PhD student, but he said something to me like, um, you can be my student, but not if you stay obsessed by Fermat's last theorem. Um, whereas Paolo was like, oh, you should be aware you're probably not going to prove Fermat's last theorem, but you should enjoy playing with it. So I preferred Paolo's attitude to Brian Birch. Although Brian's a very nice guy, and probably what he said made a lot of sense, because you, know, you can easily disappear by trying to prove a great conjecture and failing. Um, 